Hello there. It's Thursday at noon. I know it is. Do you remember our arrangement? Thursdays at noon on CFUV. Are you ready to get started? What do you have in mind? What I want to do now is called first person plural. You make it sound excessively attractive. That's what I have in mind. Canada is a small world in many ways. The beer ad joke where Americans say to every Canadian they meet, Hey, I know a Canadian named so-and-so. Do you know him? Seems a little absurd, but we've noted since being in Canada that the degrees of separation between two people seem smaller than in the country immediately to the south, which has nine times the population. Here is a case in point. A new Canadian friend we met in December started telling us of her time in Grenada as an intern with the Canadian International Development Agency, also known as CEDA, youth program. Upon introducing her to another friend, whom we knew had spent time in Panama, we discovered that the Panama internship was also sponsored by CETA. We then discovered that a third friend, a filmmaker, produced a film funded by CETA about a Guatemalan activist. Heather McAndrew's film, The Man We Called Juan Carlos, put faces and feelings upon events about which we, as North Americans, learned little during the 1980s. McAndrew's film is more relevant than ever as George W. Bush continues to build his war machine in the Middle East. The rhetoric around Bush's doctrine has been that America has never made regime change an explicit goal before. Perhaps it has not done so explicitly, but one need only ask a Guatemalan, a Panamanian, or a Grenadine about the post-World War II United States participation in changes in their governments. We mention these three countries not because they are the only examples of U.S. intervention in the affairs of other countries, but because each of our three friends had a connection to these countries through CETA. CETA's International Youth Internship Program was created in 1997 to send college graduates to developing countries for meaningful employment and working towards a development project. The purpose is twofold. First, to enable young adults to have the opportunity to learn more about sustainable development within their field of training, and second, to encourage sustainable development in impoverished countries. The internships are created in partnership with a number of businesses and not-for-profit organizations that provide the money and the security to keep interns in a country for six months. It was one of these internships that led our friend Sarah Mimic to Grenada to provide training in ecotourism. Today on First Person Plural, Sarah shares her stories of Grenada and her impressions of CETA's internship program. We thought it was important to share Heather's story and Sarah's story with our listeners this week because the mainstream media is focused upon the U.S. war machine to the exclusion of all other issues. It may seem that these stories have nothing to do with the events that are unfolding in the Middle East, but we believe they represent an alternative to the war machine. These three experiences by our Canadian friends got us thinking this week about the role Canadians and Americans play in the larger world. Understanding the global village as a place where people can help people rather than where markets are developed and exploited is the kind of globalization that can lead to peace and tolerance rather than war and endless cycles of rumors of war. It is that kind of globalization that we are examining in this week's episode of First Person Plural called Three Degrees of Separation. Much is made these days about, quote, globalization, close quote. The word evokes the specter of multinational corporations picking and choosing from the least empowered of workforces to make items for consumption by greedy North Americans. The North Americans in this cosmology give little thought to the suffering, the production and disposal of the items create in the lives of other people on the planet. The greediest among us see globalization as a means to maximize profit either through exploitation of such workforces or the so-called, quote, opening of new markets, close quote, which often is cultural genocide masked as expanding capitalism. The power mongers among us see globalization as a way to keep developing countries in their place, so to speak, and dependent upon more developed countries. Much has been produced about the abuses and shortcomings of the World Bank Group and its role in these power games, especially in relationship to the World Trade Organization and the so-called, quote, group of eight, close quote. 
The mainstream media calls the protesters at WTO events anti-globalization. This is a misnomer. Many of the protesters believe in a global view of the world, but their vision differs from that of the corporations. Globalization, they argue, can happen without the exploitation and in ways that are respectful of diversity and local culture. Those among us who are neither protesters against the greedy and powerful, nor greedy and powerful ourselves, often fall into a glazed stupor when discussions of globalization ensue. These are big issues with large consequences that seem out of reach. Some of us recycle, think about the impact of our vehicles on the environment, and maybe even avoid buying products we know were produced by slave labor or near slave labor in certain countries. But to spend time and effort understanding these larger than life forces is overwhelming and seemingly irrelevant to our daily lives. We forget that it is persons who are being hurt. We are taught to think in terms of ethnicities or nationalities rather than in terms of human beings. It is easier to dismiss the plights of the quote, Guatemalans, close quote, than it is to think about families being torn apart, livelihoods being stripped, and lives being scarred forever. Heather McAndrew's film, The Man We Called Juan Carlos, put faces and feelings upon events about which we, as North Americans, learned little during the 1980s. Reminiscent of Stephanie Black's film, Life and Debt, the documentary about the so-called free enterprise zones in Jamaica, McAndrew mixes the personal with the political in her meditation on the ways in which the filming and documentary work she and her partner, David Springbett, did in Guatemala, interacted with the life work of Wenceslao Armira, a farmer, an activist, a guerrilla warrior, and later, a Mayan priest. Heather's life and Wenceslao's life intertwined on several occasions, even though they never met in person, and these connections had consequences that neither anticipated. By presenting personal history, along with the biographical milestones of Amira, McAndrew pushes the viewer into an understanding of this man's humanity, as well as the incredible divergence of what it meant to grow up as a middle-class Canadian versus a poor Mayan farmer in Guatemala. But the film is not a guilt fest. McAndrew doesn't settle for the cheap version of these encounters, where middle-class people are led to believe that if they just change their eating habits, life will be better for the starving children in some distant land. The picture McAndrew paints is much more complex and layered, grounded in history and experience, rather than politics and ideology. Wenceslau's impact on Heather's life as a documentary filmmaker is profound. The story is about a Guatemalan farmer who, with the help of an organization from the United States called World Neighbors, began finding ways to improve the plight of the local subsistence farmers through better techniques of growing corn. As the local village began to learn how to take control of their land and their farming, they began to pull themselves out of poverty. Amira's methods were becoming well known in Central America, and delegations of other subsistence farmers found their way to his village to learn his farming techniques. It was these techniques that led to the first documentary film about Amira in 1976 by McAndrew's partner, Springbet. The shooting McAndrew did for this documentary was her first documentary work. It was a change she described in the film as one from being active in social justice causes to being a documenter of social justice causes, something that had advantages and disadvantages in her mind. While the documentary was in production, World Neighbors assisted Amira's village in the acquisition of more land so that they could expand their farms and increase their livelihood. In other words, they were successfully developing. The rhetoric of organizations such as the World Bank Group suggests that this effort should have been regarded as a resounding success. Their website states, quote, We believe that people who live in poverty should not be treated as a liability, 
but rather as a creative asset that will contribute more than anyone else to the eradication of poverty. An empowering approach to poverty reduction puts poor people at the center of development and creates the conditions that enable poor men and women to gain increased control over their lives through access to information, inclusion and participation, accountability, and local organizational capacity. Close quote. However, the Guatemalan government installed through a U.S.-backed coup just a few years before this effort felt threatened by the acquisition of land by Mayan farmers. In the 1960s, for a short time, a democratic socialist government in Guatemala began a redistribution of land from the few Spanish landowners to the Mayans. Even though this acquisition of land by Amira's village was through the market and not through any state-sponsored program, it was labeled as communist. The threat to the Mayans was so real that when the film was distributed, Amira's identity was concealed through the pseudonym Juan Carlos. This simple farmer who figured out a better way to grow his crops, feed his village, and bring himself, his family, and his neighbors out of poverty was now ipso facto an enemy of the state and a politically controversial figure. By 1984, villages had been destroyed and burned, land had been seized by the quote government, close quote, Mayans had been kidnapped and killed at the hands of the quote government, close quote, and Armira had become a guerrilla warrior. He was in exile in Mexico City when McAndrew and Springbet were invited to interview him once again. The complexities of North America's relationship to the oppression of the Mayans made it impossible for the interview filmed in 1984 to be produced and distributed. The oppression felt in Guatemala was evident in Canada as well, and this connection is not lost on McAndrew. Information control in North America contributed to the pain and suffering felt by Amira and his fellow Mayans. As Americans watching this film, we found the most poignant moment to be during a later interview where Amira notes the irony that it was Americans who came and helped them learn better farming techniques and assisted them in acquiring more land, but it was other Americans who gave their government the weapons and firepower to strip them of their land and livelihoods and kill them and their children. Roger Bunch, an American from World Neighbors, summed up the feeling best when he said, I used to be proud to be an American, now I'm not. In the end, McAndrews, the man we called Juan Carlos, is as much a story of development and the complexities of solving poverty problems in a world in which poverty serves the needs of a power class, as it is about the intertwining of her life with that of the Guatemalan farmer. The film puts flesh and bones on complicated issues of development, environment, war, power, and market exchange. It indicts the efforts of developed countries in which there are factions who at least claim to care about creating development, but in which there are also factions that just want to increase their own power and dominance. Some overlap exists between factions of the first sort and factions of the second sort. The film suggests that ordinary citizens working on these problems in local spaces have a lot more to offer in solutions than sweeping government or international policies. Much was made during the 1980s about how the strong stance Reagan took regarding the Soviet Union led to the end of the Cold War. We don't believe this is the whole story. During the 1980s, a number of people decided that the only way to end the escalation of nuclear power was for ordinary citizens to get to know each other. Delegations of Russian and U.S. citizens traveled to each other's countries and talked to each other. Phil Donahue and CNN held, quote, global town meetings, close quote, between citizens of the two countries. The citizens, thus empowered, engaged in lively debates, which were shown on national television in both countries. The citizen diplomacy put pressure on both governments to find a different way to relate to each other. It also uncovered misleading rhetoric. 
no one can really say how much of the Cold War was caused by the, quote, evil empire, close quote, rhetoric of the American government, and how much was caused by the simple exchange of human beings who chose to know their enemies as people rather than as carriers of ideologies. But we suspect that the latter had more to do with the collapse of the Berlin Wall than the politicians want us to believe. You're listening to First Person Plural on CFUV, Victoria's Public Radio, 101.9 FM, 104.3 Cable, and on the internet, cfuv.uvig.ca. Giving sociology an edge! Tell us a little bit about your background. Well, I went to school in Northern Ontario and I studied outdoor recreation, parks and tourism. And then I came back to Victoria and I studied public administration. So I have a background in recreation activities and, and tourism and ecotourism. And my interests are basically the same thing, ecotourism and community development, uh, community education and conservation, environmental activities, nature. Did you do any work here in Canada in any of those areas before you uh, left on your internship? I did when I was taking my master's at UVic. We did co-ops and I worked for the government in a number of environmental tourism related areas. I worked for the Ministry of um, Environment, Lands and Parks and we did kind of revision of a policy for commercial recreation operators out in um, the backcountry and on Crown Land. And then I also worked for BC Parks for a while and I worked for an organization called Grant Thornton and we did you know, tourism research and consulting and um, we had a few ecotourism projects that we worked on as well. How did you decide to do this internship? I mean, what was sort of what was the process when you're finished with school and looking around and what made you think this is what I want to do? Well, I always wanted to travel and I wanted to travel and also not just kind of visit one place and go from one place to the next, but to get more involved in the community and learn more about uh, the different places that I was in. And um, I was always interested in ecotourism, so, and I knew that CEDA offered different internships to do this, to gain international experience in the area that you wanted to eventually work in, and at the same time, well, travel and learn about a new culture. So, I think I had heard from a friend that CEDA offered these internships, so I just started reviewing their website to see which ones were available, and the ones that fit my background, which were kind of ecotourism and administration through my master's were the ones that I applied to. And how long did the process take in applying? For me, not too long. I think I applied maybe in in a January and then I heard back from the organization in March, so a couple months. Oh, not too bad. Then. It, it all depends on the organization because the internships usually consist of working for a Canadian organization and then you do an international component to it. So for instance I worked four months in British Columbia before I went overseas. So it depends on the organization that you're applying to to do the internship with. Give us some background about Grenada. What kind of work did you do there and how successful was the program? Well I, when I went over my kind of responsibilities or main responsibilities were to help with the training program. They were training youth in conservation and community-based tourism. So when I went over, I worked with uh, one of the locals there to to kind of teach the youth about the flora and fauna in the area, how they could develop ecotourism activities in their communities, and the, be the benefits of ecotourism. Okay, so you were talking about you did stuff with ecotourism. Mm -hmm. Training youth in ecotourism and benefits and disadvantages and how the community can promote more ecotourism. More is a su sustainable activity, so 
um, and a conservation activity rather than the actual industry in itself. Mm -hmm. So making the community more sustainable, sustainable in itself and also um, promoting community development so alternatives to different economic industries for gaining revenue, I guess, for the community. So and we also, um, I also did computer literacy training for the youth. So the community I was in, they had maybe one or two one or two personal com computers and, the, and then the kids had access to computers for the schools but it was really limited so we basically designed a computer literacy course and conducted it with the youth there as well. Now what kind of, um, you're talking about the community, tell me a little bit about Grenada's, like where you worked at and sort of the economy of Grenada and what's going on there. I mean are, are, are they significantly less developed than Canada? Is it, um, you know, just to be an idea of what it's like there. Well, it's a very small country. There's maybe approximately 90,000 people in total. So the, there's three kind of main islands. One is the main island of Grenada itself, and then there's two smaller islands. One is called Caricou, the other one is Petit Martinique. And Caricou was the one where I was located, and that's about 6,000 people. So it was a really small island where I was. In terms of economy, it's, well, a lot of people might know Grenada also is the Isle of Spice, because one of their main economic activities is agriculture, and they do a lot of exporting in spices such as nutmeg and mace, and um, while well, they also export in bananas and cocoa. But they also do a lot of fishing, and tourism is a main economic industry as well. Are they moving forward? I mean, is it a fairly positive place right now, or is it very depressed? What's the uh, sort of economic climate there? I think economically, they're moving forward. I think, for one, they get a lot of foreign aid, especially from Canada and, and from CETA. So I think I didn't not notice personally that much of a difference economically. I think if, and I, I don't necessarily have expertise mm -hmm. to judge, but maybe where I would say it's more considered a developing country is, is socially mm -hmm. compared to economically. Mm -hmm. Another thing is that a lot of people from Grenada, a lot of um, families come over to the United States and Canada and England to work and so they send a lot of money back to their families in Grenada to help support. So that's another main kind of source of income for the communities in Grenada. Of course, most people in the United States remember Grenada because of the so-called rescue mm -hmm. <laughs> that happened in the early 80s. How did that affect going there as you know, somebody from Canada, somebody who's associated with North America? Does, is there a kind of history there? with North Americans that sort of gave a context? Well, I think definitely the revolution in the early 80s is still talked about, and it's still very prominent on the minds of, of Grenadians. I think as a Canadian, it didn't affect me so much. Like, I would discuss the issues and the events with people in Grenada, but I think because I'm Canadian, there wasn't as much of um, an issue. But I know one thing they have in Grenada is they have a medi uh, medical school, which is um, American, and there's there's still some kind of conflict between the medical students and the Grenadians themselves. I don't know if it goes goes back to the revolution, but I think, or if it's because of issues now, um, there's not necessarily that much integration between the two, but um, it's it's there. Mm -hmm. So. The events that happened in the early 80s are still very much on the minds of Grenadians. What's the uh, major language there? The English. English is the language now? They speak English, but a lot of Grenadians, especially the older generations, speak a little bit of Patois, which is kind of an older version of French and the native language mixed. Oh, mm, interesting. And is that the history of Grenada? It's, it was a French colony at first? It was first settled by the French, and then I think the British came, and then they um, kind of 
lived there together, the British and the French, and then eventually the British expanded and I think there was a treaty signed where the British owned um, Grenada and then Grenada gained independence in 1974, I believe. You stayed beyond the duration of your internship when you were in Grenada, is that right? Yes, that's right. My internship was originally for five and a half months in Grenada with CEDA funding and through my organization here. And then I stayed beyond another six months there on my own, as my own kind of volunteer with my own financing and funds. And I, the reason I did that is because this was for my personal project. I felt after about five and a half months when my internship was officially being ended, I just kind of felt like I had just gotten going with the youth. I established a relationship with them, a trusting relationship, and we were just starting to kind of go deeper into um, more of the training. And it wasn't actually quite finished then. If I had left, the training still would have gone on with the other trainers, the local trainer from Grenada and other staff from the organization. So I wanted to complete the training and um, also the organization that I was working with was starting new projects. They do a variety of different projects and one of the ones that they would start was sea turtle conservation. Hmm. And that's seasonal because of when the sea turtles come up to nest on the beach. So I wanted to stay and learn more about that.
You're listening to First Person Plural. Today we are addressing the question of how the word globalization could be redefined as a means for ending poverty and creating sustainable development. Stay tuned for the remainder of Sarah Mimic's Grenada story and our meditations on how small the world is in which we live if you measure it by interpersonal connections. Now back to Three Degrees of Separation. Do they um, block off the nest the way they do in Florida with the sea turtles so that they protect the eggs when they come up on the beach and lay the eggs and have people who watch them? There are sea turtle watches in Florida, so I'm a little bit familiar. Mm-hmm. And that's one of the things they're, they're doing down Cary Coo, too, and also on Grenada and other parts of Grenada, um, is that they're trying to promote sea turtle watching as an ecotourism activity and they also monitor them. So we would go out at night and we would monitor the sea turtles and we would um, tag them so we could track more of their um, ha- like their behavior mm-hmm. and also um, just do more research. So we would count the eggs, we would determine where on the beach they would lay, if they would come back in a couple weeks to lay more eggs and um, that kind of data. We would collect mm-hmm. data on there. Do they have a 24 hour watch going on with the eggs? To protect them? We we didn't. The project where I was was just getting off the ground. They were just starting to do more sea turtle conservation mm-hmm. work. But I know that different organizations around the Caribbean, different projects actually do that. They're, they're becoming quite um, extensive throughout the Caribbean. It's a pretty popular activity in Florida now. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. And um, the, along the beaches in Florida, you can see during the season they have um, tape around to make sure that anybody using the beach knows not to go in that area Mm -hmm. and then they have somebody who just comes out there with a lawn chair and takes shifts and on just kind of keeps a watch over so that when the eggs actually hatch and the turtles go back in one of the problems they had I guess was with lighting on the beach Mm -hmm. the turtles were turning towards the lighting yeah. rather than going back out to sea yeah. and they needed to go to sea immediately mm-hmm. or they were going to um, not survive. survive exactly that's the hatchlings yeah yeah because when they when they hatch normally or when there was not any development on the beach or on the, um, the coastal line that the the hatchlings recognize the horizon of the sea because it's lighter right. than inland so they would like instinctively go towards the water and now because of some of the stronger lights um, yeah they go inland which is um, dangerous, de- dangerous De- deadly, really. deadly yeah. yeah exactly so yeah I know in most of the beach towns now in Florida there are laws about where the lighting goes mm-hmm. and any lighting is directed away from the beach so the beaches are much darker now than they used yeah. to be yeah and uh, with the turtle watches they also help ensure that the turtles go in the right direction if something happens. Yeah. They like blacken the light mm-hmm. and try to get them to sort of herd them back towards back. the ocean. Mm-hmm. And that's just one of the threats. Like there's so many different threats to the sea turtles now, um, both in the water and then also out. Like another one is um, car tracks on the beach. A lot of the driving the hatchlings, they get stuck in the tracks, the car tracks, and they can't get out so that they die of maybe dehydration or a predator or a bird will catch it and eat it. So there's there's a lot of different factors um, and different reasons why we're promoting conservation. And we would monitor at night, but um, I think one of the things that's happening now is a lot of volunteers are coming from all over the world to try and help out with the projects. So yeah, that actually was going to be my next question. When you talk about ecotourism, what kinds of, I mean, where are these people coming from? to go there and participate in this and how do the locals interact with those people I mean are they creating like other kinds of things I I would assume lodging would come up Mm -hmm. and transportation so how does that benefit the local economy Mm -hmm. to have these people come in and do what they're doing well for ecotourism we what we did on Cary Q is there was a local guide who would who would bring the tourists out. The tourists would come from all over the world. Um, most of them would come to Karakou for the Caribbean experience, so beach and sun and sand, and then they would stay at a local hotel or a local guest house on the island. 
And then they would um, come turtle watching at night and there was local guides who would take them out and show them the beach and then explain about the behavior of the turtle coming up. And it's amazing to see the turtle emerge from, from the ocean and then to lay its eggs. It's really an interesting experience. And then they would also learn about the different ecosystem on the beach and the different animals and, um, yeah, things that were happening. So, so the exchange is not just these people coming and doing something for the local ecosystem. They also bring back the experiences of learning mm -hmm. about that ecosystem and yeah. the, the wonder, if you will, of seeing these things in action. Mm -hmm. So there is there is a definite exchange going on. It's not, ta-da, we have showed up to save the day yeah, and no. save your turtles for you kind no, of experience. No, definitely not. Yeah. Okay. One of the things that I was concerned about when you first told me about um, this kind of program and something that I'd like you to kind of address for me is that there, there's always been among Europeans and North Americans this kind of send your youth out to exotic places for their coming of age, if you will. Mm -hmm. And in the past, and I mean in the distant past as well as the recent past, that has involved a certain amount of, of an imperialistic agenda in some ways. Mm -hmm. And there's been criticism about programs walking in the door and educating people and bringing capitalism, bringing Western culture and sort of obliterating the culture where you go to. Mm -hmm. Because I know you and because I've looked a little bit on the website, I get a different feeling about these internships. And I wondered if you could tell me how it's different, how what you did is not Canadians showing up teaching Canadianism mm -hmm. or North Americanism or capitalism to Grenadians. Mm -hmm. How is it different from this kind of imperialistic past? Mm -hmm. Well, I think definitely there is some element of that still. And I, don't, and I think it depends on the project and I think it also depends on the person and the organization and how the project is being implemented. Um, I think I definitely tried not to do that. And one of the things that I try to do is you, you need to be very open that it's a two-way exchange. That, and I think in a lot of this, I probably learned a lot more than some of the locals there, or some of the youth from me. Um, I think that what I tried to do is, I, didn't, I tried just to teach generally what I knew about ecotourism in general. And the more specific information about the flora and fauna and and the ecosystems on Q would come from the local trainers that we were working with. One of the things I tried to do too is, is really build a relationship with the students or the youth that I worked with so we would get to know each other one-on-one -on -one and as just as people and I and I think that that really helped and that's one of the reasons why I didn't want to leave after five and a half month, months because the because I wanted to continue with the relationship. Did your agenda change while you were there because of this response and the two-way thing? Like you came with a certain idea about what ecotourism would and would not be, mm -hmm. but did it evolve in this exchange to become something different than what you imagined before you got there? Mm -hmm. For me, it de definitely did. I think that I learned a lot more about ecotourism in the community sense, in a, living on a small island in a small community how it wasn't just about ecotourism in itself, it was more about community development and uh, sustainable development for our community. So um, it wasn't necessarily just about ecotourism it, itself, and that ecotourism was just an alternative to the community for using their resources that would remain longer for in a more sustainable manner. Yeah. <laughs> so it, it was an evolution that kind of took place. Mm -hmm. Them. And I think for me, I actually saw it in action, like it, it firsthand, rather than more just because of my background, more doing research on it and learning about it, kind of in schools. So, and I know that 
a lot of people have different ideas of what ecotourism is. And I think that some people try and stay away from the word, but what I like most about my learning experience is I learn more about community-based ecotourism, how the community, the different organizations interact and link together in a more of a network than an operation on its own. So the different operations would try and support each other, so maybe a visitor would come in on the ferry that would then use a local taxi or a local bus to bring them to the hotel. So each of the different organizations would benefit in some way. Mm -hmm. Why would you recommend that young people pursue these kinds of internships? What benefits do Canadians receive from working abroad in such countries? Well, I think for youth it's a great experience. I think you get international experience learning about different cultures, learning about different ways um, in which the world works, different perspectives on life and communities. Um, so I, and I think that that's important just to kind of look at the world and, to, and where you live with a more broader perspective so you kind of get um, an outside look, a more objective look at what you're doing in your own country when you see something different. I think also it's um, great if you want to go in, I think now because the world is global, if you want to go, most of um, what we do in the industries in Canada have some kind of international impact. We really appreciate your time. Okay, thanks. Yeah, thanks a lot for dropping by. You're listening to First Person Plural, your source for soothing sounds of sociological sagaciousness. The police state is using its phallocentric organ, the corporate media to control ordinary people like you and me. For those of you unaware of the rules of Six Degrees of Kevin Bacon, I'd like to outline them for you now. Six Degrees of Kevin Bacon is a game that attempts to link actor Kevin Bacon to any other actor who has appeared in a film by noting that he was either in a film with Kevin Bacon or in a film with someone who was in a film with Kevin Bacon or in a film with someone who was in a film with someone who was in a film with Kevin Bacon and so on up to six degrees of separation hence the name of the game for example Donald Sutherland is first degree in this game because he was in Animal House with Kevin Bacon. He was also in JFK with Kevin Bacon. The theory was for some time that anybody who had been in a movie could be linked to Kevin Bacon in six degrees or less. Recently examples of seven and eight degree actors have come to light. This from the Internet Movie Database at imdb.com. Actors not within the Internet Movie Database are not considered but so far the maximum degrees of separation that any actor has achieved, if that is the word here, has been eight. So do you know how that game came into existence? A couple of bored college students were sitting around and decided to mock Kevin Bacon by putting him at the center of a cosmology. But do you know why they figured out the six degrees part? Was there a theoretical grounding? There was an anthropological grounding. Well, let's hear about it. Turns out there's an anthropologist who did an experiment. He had a theory that there are only six degrees of separation between any one person on Earth and any other person on Earth. That is, if you wanted to meet a person, it shouldn't take you linking to them more than through six people. He tested this theory by going out to the Midwest and recruiting a thousand participants who were asked to write a letter to a divinity student at Harvard if they knew him. If they didn't know the student that they were told of, 
but suspected that they knew somebody who might know him, they were asked to write a letter to the person that they thought might know him and ask that person to either write a letter to him or write a letter to somebody that they thought might know him. Eventually, a letter arrived at the Divinity student's mailbox. And when that letter arrived, they were asked to put all the other letters that came in it so that you could see how many letters it took to get to the Divinity student. The average number of letters that it took to get to the Divinity student was four. That was the average. Yes. So some people took a little bit longer, a lot of people took a lot less, and it averaged out to four letters per person in the Midwest to get to the Divinity student. All of this is apropos to our title for this week's episode, which is Three Degrees of Separation. Many of you are thinking, but isn't the expression supposed to be six degrees of separation? And we picked three degrees because we had these three friends who didn't know each other, who all had similar experiences, who connected through us. And we, in turn, connect through them to three parts of the world that we haven't given a lot of thought of before. Technically, those are not degrees of separation. One is quick to point out. But one is also quick to point out that we didn't care when we came up with the title for this episode. We simply wanted to pick a number other than six to avoid, shall we say, interesting situations from arising. Well, the other thing is that I think that there are fewer degrees of separation between people in Canada than there are between people in the U.S. It's been interesting to me to see how many people I meet who know somebody who knows somebody that I know in Canada. It's also been interesting to me that I've already met two cabinet members and I have spent the first 40 some odd years of my life in the United States and met only one person from the Senate and nobody from the executive branch. When you say the cabinet, you mean the Canadian federal cabinet, and you mean from the sitting government, not former cabinet ministers. Yes. The point is, I feel like even in the two short years that I've been in Canada, that I'm closer to the federal government than I ever was in the United States. The world is a smaller place than a lot of us think. That when we talk about globalization, when we talk about these big issues, we usually think about them in very macro terms with discussions about policy and discussions about big budgets with billions and trillions of dollars in them and that kind of thing. And the truth of the matter is there's an awful lot going on on a micro level. There are people traveling across borders all of the time. And when they move around like that, a lot of them go with very humanitarian reasons. And when they get to where they're going, they do good things and make connections, real connections, with real human beings. And those connections do affect these bigger issues. One of the ways that wars and conflicts develop is by depersonalizing and isolating populations. And the reason that governments like to depersonalize and isolate is because it's a hell of a lot harder to go rah rah let's go kill people that you know it's less convenient in any case i mean not as many embarrassing situations would arise i'd guess yeah it's hard to imagine you know it's one thing to imagine attacking some place where you don't know anybody but it's a whole other thing to imagine attacking a place where you have friends, where you have relatives, where you have met people and known people, at least like the people that you're about ready to attack. Is there a sociologically popular term for the tendency of people to blame things on those who are out of the room at the moment? We have a tendency to look at who we are by deciding who the other is. And so it is important to distinguish who is out of the room and who is in the room, so to speak. 
and we define who is in the room often by who is excluded. Instead of looking around and going, this is who we are, we often say, this is who we are not. So we're freedom-loving people, and they are terrorists. We're democracy-loving people, and they are living in tyranny. And all of this is by definition. It's not that people with these characteristics are placed into the appropriate groups. It's that these characteristics are assigned to the in-group and the out-group after the fact. Sure. After assignment of individuals to each group occurs. Right. It isn't necessarily assigning to individuals as much as it's assigning to groups. This is a more subtle point, though. It's the tendency of someone who is present to fight back when he's accused of something. It is safer, in a word, to blame people who are not present. Sure. But I see the overlap between the concepts. Yes. They're out of the room. They're out of the group. It makes sense to be upset with them. Yeah, I just saw Animal Farm, the movie Animal Farm, or a movie rendition of it. I think it was a 1999 version with Muppets as part of the animals. But The Muppets did a movie version of Animal Farm. No, Jim Henson provided the puppetry. They look like animals. They didn't look like the Muppets. There's a character in Animal Farm called Snowball, and one of the ways that the the pigs came into power and kept power over the other animals at the animal farm was to talk about who was doing Snowball's work and who was friends with Snowball and who was agents for Snowball and so forth. And that kind of painting of the enemy and association with the enemy is a way of defining who we, who is who, who is on the in-group who is on the out-group. The subtext being nothing other than that which serves this discourse or this paradigm could be worthwhile. The idea of considering new ideas is completely out the window at that point. Yes. The way to break that down or hack into that kind of thinking is for people to get to know each other that once people begin to connect, they begin to see their similarities as well as their differences, and they begin to create a more complex picture of each other, it no longer is easy to cast people in one role or the other, to cast groups in one role or the other. You have been listening to First Person Plural, because how people get along with each other still matters. First Person Plural is a show created for community radio by Carl Wilkerson and Dr. Patty Thomas to examine social and organizational issues. Music for First Person Plural is performed, composed, and produced by Carl Wilkerson, except where noted. For more information about First Person Plural, Dr. Patty Thomas, or Carl Wilkerson, Visit our website, www.culturalconstructioncompany.com, or email us at fpp at culturalconstructioncompany.com. 